Thank you, Susan. So next we have our last session, the, our last talk for this topic, and we have Joe Hoyt. He'll be talking about the Battle of the Atlantic. Joe is a maritime archaeologist with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. He specializes in archaeological recording of deep water shipwrecks. He's worked on several NOAA projects in the Thunder Bay, Florida Keys, and Monitor National Marine Sanctuaries since 2001. And um, for the last six years, Hoyt has been a, a PI on a multifaceted wide area investigation of World War II era shipwrecks lost, lost off the coast of North, North Carolina. He has an MA in Maritime History and Nautical Archaeology from East Carolina University. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate everybody uh, giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, uh, we've been talking on over the last two days a lot about the theoretical approaches to cultural landscapes. And what I'm going to do is talk about uh, an applied cultural landscape approach and the way that we've uh, sort of internalized it at the site that I work for, uh, which is the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary. Um, we were fortunate in 2007 to open the USS Monitor Center, which sort of put to bed one era of the work that we were doing uh, in the North Carolina area and began an a ongoing period of conservation. And around that time, we began to say, all right, well, what's next? We've got all this experience and this ex expertise working on heritage resources offshore North Carolina. And we began to start this process to look at what else is out there. And uh, it was pretty exciting to have the ability to begin that process and be able to frame it under this lens of cultural landscapes and, and look at this broad area and really kind of understand it. So Jim, Jim talked yesterday about the overview study that we did, uh, which is available outside if you're interested in looking at that. Uh, but the first step in that was sort of to just try to wrap our heads around the vast resources that exist off this area. So we developed this database, and we've got about 2,000 points in this database of, of named shipwrecks and associated terrestrial sites, life-saving service stations, airfields, things like this. And we began to sort of thematically stovepipe uh, all this information so that we could begin to really use it sort of as a roadmap that we could then cherry pick individual points from to go and do more in-depth analyses. Uh, so this is just sort of an example of how we, we framed the way that we could look at, at our data sets, um, breaking it into things like the pre-contact period, the colonial era period, uh, maritime commerce, uh, various conflicts that have happened along the coast, um, as well as things that are associated with uh, just coastal uh, vernacular watercraft and fishing heritage and things like this. Um, so again, you can look at this in more detail in that, that assessment. And once we completed this approach, we said, all right, well, what's the, what's the first thing? What is, what's the first thing that we're going to dive deeper into? And the natural uh, progression of that was World War II. Um, so the, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the story, we were very, and I was very interested to hear Kristen say that there's, there's 10,000 uh, battlefield sites in the United States from various conflicts. How many of those do you think are from World War II? Very, very few, right? Pearl Harbor, the Aleutian Islands, um, a couple isolated things on the on the west coast. But really, it is the Battle of the Atlantic on the east east coast of the United States and in the Gulf of Mexico, where we really have an American battlefield uh, that has not really been well interpreted and known to the broader public. So that was where we saw an opportunity to apply some of the expertise of the sanctuary program and characterizing this story in a way that hasn't been done before and, and, and projecting it. Um, to as many people as possible. So just a quick background on, on the way that we started looking at this. Uh, around, right around Pearl Harbor at, and December s uh, 7th of 41, by the 11th, Hitler had declared war on the United States. And by January 18th, the first ship was sunk off North Carolina. So it's, it's pretty remarkable how quickly this happened. And uh, so clearly, they were ready for a war that we were sort of uh, trying to resist becoming involved in. And uh, as a result, the there really wasn't a lot of coastal defense on the East Coast, uh, being that the popular support for the war was in the Pacific Theater at that time. So we have all these vessels that are operating up and down the eastern seaboard that are relatively uh, exposed, and you have U-boats that are there just sinking ships. So wh why are they there doing this? Predominantly oil. So you've got huge oil fields in the Gulf of Mexico, oil's coming up the East Coast, and it's hitting Cape Hatteras, riding the Gulf Stream, and taking a right heading towards Europe where it's fueling the RAF bombing raids and all these other things. So there's a huge resource of oil uh, and tankers coming up 
uh, the East Coast, and the thinking of Germany was, well, we're not going to be able to compete uh, with Britain or the U.S. Uh, we don't have, we're not on par with their surface uh, fleet. So what we can do is we can go cut off the supply chain and hopefully uh, squelch the ability for them to wage war in the European theater. Um, so this was, it's interesting, we were, you talk about a battlefield and uh, you, you know, you usually think of a battlefield as something taking place in a relatively short period of time over the course of uh, maybe a couple of days or weeks. The Battle of the Atlantic was different. It was a very protracted engagement that took place really from the onset of, um, the, of World War II and America's involvement all the way till, till the end. And it was ongoing before we were involved in the North Atlantic. Um, so how do you characterize something that, that takes place over a longer period of time and really understand how that, how that works? And it's over such a geographically huge area, really from Nova Scotia on down into the Gulf of Mexico. So I'll just Uh, so we began this, this comprehensive uh, shipwreck assessment of world, these World War II resources uh, off North Carolina. We really began to, s to understand that North Carolina plays a, a particularly unique role in this history. And as I said, if you're trying to, to characterize this war that took place in this huge area, why are we so obsessed with North Carolina? What makes it, what makes it unique? And it, this is where we really started to understand how applicable incorporating features in the landscape was to the overall interpretation of what's going on. So North Carolina has some very unique uh, um, geological features that have made it uh, particularly appealing tactically for the way that U-boats were operating. So you've got things like uh, shipping lanes that are coming up uh, in the Gulf Stream. You've got two major oceanic currents that are coming to a head right off of the Outer Banks. And you know, historically, not just in the, the World War II era, these were ma massively important uh, currents because you could actually get a few knots of speed and, and they were pushing you back and towards, uh, towards Europe. So I always think of this sort of one of those moving walkways in an airport. You've got all these, these ships that are laden with fuel oil uh, heading, heading across the Atlantic uh, to, to uh, support that war effort and they're coming right along Cape Hatteras. Now, the other thing that is really interesting about this particular naval engagement is that up until this point in history, really World War I and then more so in World War II, naval battlefields took place predominantly on the surface plane, right? They're taking place where you, you, you're still interacting with the environment, you're trying to, you know, it's the age of sail, you're trying to get the weather gauge, or you're, you're uh, dealing with shoreline features, uh, but it's generally on this planar surface. Well, in this uh, instance, the Battle of the Atlantic was involved with merchant vessels, surface craft, but then you have submersibles, so the water column itself has a role tactically in, in the water depth and where things could operate. Um, and then you have the atmospheric column as well. We, we, have, we had uh, uh, air coverage was a, a massive threat to the U-boats, one of the best uh, defensive aids against that threat. So you've got this atmospheric column. So really, it's, we've got this 3D column of space wherein all these, these different players are operating. So this allows us to really understand and characterize some of those things through that cocoa lens. Um, and understanding how those play a role tactically. So, for instance, the uh, the water depth you can see. Does this have a pointer? Um, not really. The water depth. I don't, it's kind of hard to see on this here, but there's the, these contour lines off the coast. There are uh, depicting the, the outer continental shelf. The significance of this for this particular engagement is that the um, you know, U-boats were a very very good offensive weapon, but a, a pretty terrible defensive weapon. They, they relied on stealth. They relied on their ability to have these sort of sneak attacks. But if they're spotted on the surface, or they had to engage with a surface vessel, they still had to, their, their main battery is their torpedoes. They still had to actually maneuver the vessel. They were quite easy to sink, as they were uh, you know, not made to uh, be great surface crafts. And so their primary defense was to be able to hide in deep water. So they wanted to be close to the shipping lanes but they wanted to be able to get to deep water quickly to be able to evade counterattacks. Now, if you look at the way that the, the continental shelf is uh, situated on the east coast, uh, uh, north of Cape Hatteras, the continental shelf is very far offshore, so you still have shipping lanes that run, oh, that'd be great. The, um, you see here, this is the, this is the continental shelf north of Hatteras, 
and it goes uh, hundreds of miles offshore as you get up towards uh, the uh, Boston, New York, New England area. So there's still heavy shipping lanes there, but your ability to get to deep water for safety is, is limited. So there's still U-boat activity there, but it was better to be in these areas where the continental shelf is closer. South of Hatteras, it's very close to shore. As you go further south, it's even closer to shore down here, but then you run into another issue where you have much warmer water. Why is warm water a factor? Because U-boats uh, typically like to operate at night, and you had a much higher concentration of bioluminescent algae in that area. So they would, they would like to avoid that, that region for that purpose. So as a result, there's all these sort of natural features that make Cape Hatteras uh, emerge as sort of a hot spot of U-boat activity, and this became known to the Germans who were incentivized uh, based on tonnage sunk that this was a place you could go and you could, you could make your mark and, uh, and get your promotions and things because Cape Hatteras was so uh, preferred as a hunting ground. Now, I should, I should also say that many of these features in the landscape are, are relevant to really all these other elements in that broader study. So this is sort of a baseline understanding of this. that's you know, not just World War II history that has been impacted by the unique characteristics of North Carolina, but uh, so these could be applied to some of those other elements as well. But specific to the battlefield, there's, uh, there's these other uh, elements that we have been assessing. And these are these sort of more mercurial or ephemeral elements of the battlefield where you have things like cloud cover, cover weather, visibility, airspace. Um, this is a, a gentleman named Harry, Harry Kane Jr. who was a pilot uh, of a Hudson aircraft out of Cherry Point, North Carolina, at the U.S. Army Air Corps, who was the first, uh, first person to sink a U-boat with aircraft off the East Coast. So he's pointing to a point just off of Cape Hatteras where he sunk the U-701. And in the narrative of his, uh, his attack, he was using cloud cover uh, to conceal his approach. So the, the U-boats were very well aware that they're most vulnerable from air attacks. They actually had uh, on, the, on the conning tower, they had four people anytime they were on the surface specifically to watch different quadrants of air uh, for, for the, uh, so they could crash dive if there was a, a threat of aircraft attack. And he knew this, Harry Kane knew this, so he knew that if he was going to be on anti-submarine patrol that he had to conceal as best as possible his approach and did that using cloud cover. So it's an interesting way to look at all these different things in the, even though that the, uh, these things aren't, are not a tangible elements that can be pinpointed because they are fleeting, uh, they still have a role in the way that human beings are interacting in this landscape and, and it has an influence on tactics in the battlefield sense. And then, of course, there's these other tangible elements uh, that are related to uh, the battlefield, the proximity of air bases, the Elizabeth City um, uh, airship base, Cherry Point uh, Naval Air Station, and uh, life-saving stations along the beach, the proximity of deep water ports. Um, there was a defensive minefield off of Hatteras that influenced the way that vessels operated in the area, and, of course, the shipwrecks themselves. So we, we began this, this larger study looking at, the, looking at it from a broad view, looking at all the resources that we have. And, and um, really this was about a six-month period where the, the heavy um, uh, activity was taking place. There resulted in the loss of about, uh, well not, I shouldn't say the loss, but uh, there were about 90 vessels sunk um, in that six-month window, which is quite alarming. It's, it's a pretty amazing amount of vessels to go down in a short period of time, off, just off of North Carolina alone. Now that we, we kind of peel that back to vessels that we believe that are just on the continental shelf, um, and that number is about 50 sites. So that's quite a lot to, to manage and uh, to try and understand. So we start off with a sort of a GIS exercise, and this is depicting not just, uh, not just sites where there was actual tangible material deposited vis-a-vis -vis a shipwreck, but where there was uh, an, any type of engagement so a U-boat may have attacked uh, and struck a merchant vessel with a torpedo, but the merchant vessel was sailing in ballast. It didn't sink and was able to be refitted. That's still recorded because it's still relevant to this overall story of how these things were interacting in this environment and, and allowing us to understand why certain areas had, uh, had more significance than others. So we take this, and then we can apply some, some uh, statistical analyses and start to develop sort of these hot spots of areas of battle-related events. And this is important because not only is it 
right. not only does it help us understand where these things are, but we're a program that is a place-based management program, and if we're going to position ourselves to say there should be an expanded sanctuary in this area, we need to be able to back up why, why an area like Cape Hatteras and not an area like Wilmington or, or anywhere else along the coast. So this gives us the ability to not only interpret the events more accurately and completely, but to be able to convey to the public and to anyone that's consuming it why we think an area has significance and how it relates directly to this based on real data. So that's basically the, the really 30,000 foot view. And then we began also through American Battlefield Protection Program grant in partnership with East Carolina University and Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, uh, a more laser focused study looking directly at one discrete convoy battle, right? So, so this, this broad study started with looking at all this different activity that was taking place over a six month window. And now we're looking and applying sort of the same approach to, uh, to one particular uh, afternoon in July of 1942, where there was a convoy of 19 ships sailing from Norfolk, Virginia to Key West, escorted by five vessels and some, uh, some aircraft that was attacked by the U-576 and had uh, one uh, Nicaraguan freighter called the Bluefields, which is pictured here was sunk immediately, and uh, two other vessels, the J.A. Mowinkle and the Chalori, uh, were struck but did not sink. And as a result of this, the U-boat popped to the center uh, of the convoy in broad daylight. An armed merchant vessel called the Unicoi opened fire, and two Navy Kingfisher aircraft came in and <coughs> sunk the U-boat. All of this took place in the span of about 15 minutes. So we said, well, how can we, first of all, we, how can we find where this happened? And, and then is, is it going to be uh, applicable to study it using th this uh, Kokoa lens through our, our um, Battlefield Protection Program grant? So the first thing that we did, we partnered with East Carolina University and had uh, a, a grad student, John Bright, who's no longer a grad student, that worked on uh, developing some of this modeling. So we collected all this archival material and started to figure out, okay, how would this convoy have been situated? How would it have been moving through this space? based on what we know uh, of how it was set up, where the escort vessel districts were. So there were five escort vessels that had sort of these zones set up around the convoy. This was the pattern of the 19 ships. These are the three ships that were struck. And then we're modeling, based on the narrative of the event, where the most likely position the U-boat would have been. Uh, the, the different colors of this line is sort of depicting the, uh, what we know the operational restrictions of uh, the torpedoes were, the maximum ranges, the optimal ranges of where it could fire and then creating this model. But we don't know exactly where it really fits in 3D space until we find tangible remains. Uh, so that was the focus of one of our projects, is figuring out where this is. And so we developed this, uh, this survey model to figure out where do we need to go look. But it, it carries, it's it permeated with these elements of, uh, of this landscape approach. You'll see here, this is just a probability model that was developed based on all the historic information that we had uh, so you'll see these, these individual positions are uh, after action reports, um, which is really frustrating because there's a half a dozen after action reports all talking about the exact same event that only happened in one place, but they plot out over like a 40 square mile area. It was really convenient. Um, and then you have, I mean, we have these other elements where, okay, we know that the typical convoy route was to follow the 100 fathom curve line so that it could avoid the Diamond Shoals. So that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing sort of this lighter uh, sort of snaking uh, that's, that's just where we know the convoy ought to have been running. And then if you see kind of coming in shore here, we know that when the Trelori and the J.A. Mowinkle were struck, they were towed out of the field of fire and into um, uh, an area where they were ostensibly going to be repaired, but unfortunately were towed directly into the minefield where they also struck mines uh, in, in this area here. So all these models go come together and we develop this probability model and then we break it down into areas that have you know, the most likelihood to, to survey. So we, we ended up using this to, to develop and dictate the, the survey areas that we did. This was the first year that we looked. This was our priority one box. And as a, as a fun little side note, you'll see that we did not get that little corner in that first year because of the water depth there and the li limitations of our uh, equipment. So fast forward six years, and the U-boat is about 160 feet from the edge of that. <laughs> <laughs> at that point, <laughs> but uh, uh, so fortunately, uh, uh, last year we were able to find the remains uh, of the Bluefields, uh, and also, fortunately for interpretive reasons, the U-boat is about 200 yards away from the Bluefields. So it's really 
Uh, we're hoping to get back to get some better imagery of these sites, but the proximity of these things is such an easy way to digest this, uh, this notion of a battlefield where you've got both these elements that are really close together in this one space that allow us to, to interpret this, these, these activities. Oh, finishing up here. So this, again, this is the, uh, uh, the remains of the U-576. It's in deep water. It's about 700 feet of water, so it's, it's got really good level of preservation. And um, so anyhow, that's, that's the, the focus that we've had and the way that, that the cultural landscape approach has directed our research. But I would, al would also like to mention that it has also had, it has permeated every aspect of our management as we've been moving towards looking at things like expanded boundaries. Uh, I should also mention we have had, I think by the end of the year, we'll have about 12 of these sites nominated to the National Register, working with Dee Marks, who's prepared a lot of these. And um, she's also done a multiple property nomination for, um, for World War II resources in the East, East Coast and Gulf of Mexico. And um, but just, just real quick to finish, the way that this has this approach and this way of thinking has permeated every element of our management from research through the public process that we have is, first of all, it allows, uh, allows us not just in the Battle of the Atlantic aspect, but in this broader uh, approach, is to help inform and identify stakeholders that we might not have had connections with in the past. Uh, we have things like advisory councils that are made up of members of the public. Um, and if we come to them and say, all right, we've got archaeologists, historians, we also have people that are uh, on tourism boards and restaurant owners and local fishermen and, and businesses that have uh, that are part of these affected communities, and we're asking them to make decisions or g uh, inform us of what their concerns are in these communities. So we have to have something to, to say to a restaurant owner, here's, here's what the resource is, and here's the way that we interpret it, and now you, now you can have a voice that's more informed on how we should move things forward. So we did that exact thing with our expansion working group um, that we had uh, that has set up and made a, the, our advisory council had made a recommendation that our site look into expanding the boundaries to include some of these resources. And all of it has been sort of funneled through this lens of this cultural landscape approach, even towards the development of the boundaries themselves, um, which are still in flux and up in the air. Uh, and then ultimately, if we do go forward with an expanded effort, we can use the elements of this cultural landscape approach to, uh, to help develop required documents like our draft environmental impact studies and to use that to better define the affected resources. Uh, so it really ends up sort of being our guiding framework moving forward at our little site. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you.